RESO antitrust policy. RESO strives to increase competition in the marketplace and will not be a forum for anti-competitive conduct. The RESO antitrust policy governs the activities of RESO and its members, including this meeting. Please consult Resource Council if you have any questions about the policy. All right, thank you for joining us for the Cross-Platform Interoperability Work Group. Uh, putting the pieces together is our title today. Do I do this afterwards then? Okay, sounds good. So stick around to the end and you get that. That's our hook, in case you don't find us interesting enough with just the presentation. All right, so what we want to talk about today is give a little bit of an update on where we are with the interoperability work group. Uh, we're still a relatively new group within RESO, just got chartered back in January, had about eight meetings since then. And so for those of you who aren't on the work group calls, first of all, why not? So there's a lot more people in this room than the uh, 20 or 30 that are signed up and usually on those calls. So make sure you're joining those if you're not. It's every Tuesday, or it's Tuesdays at two, usually the second Tuesday of the month and we go anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes. But what I wanted to do first is give you a little update on what we've been doing with interoperability, uh, what we've been talking about within that group, and then how that's gonna lead into the second part of the day. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Chris Rand. I'm the chair for cross-platform interoperability. Also work at MRED as their CTO. Uh, been in the MLS side for about a year and a half. And interoperability to me is something that I've worked on for a very long time, even before I joined Reso and uh, joined MRED because interoperability was all about working with agents in the brokerage that I worked with to try and get their marketing systems, their technologies, their tools to work together, to talk to each other. So we were having conversations about interoperability at a brokerage level before I even knew what interoperability really was. Um, and it was a really, really tough concept for agents to understand why the data that they put in one system didn't just easily flow into every other system they used. Why couldn't all these partners just work together? After all, I'm the agent, I'm the customer. You should do what I want as the customer, right? So why can't we just make this easy? And it was a really tough conversation to have because obviously it's not that simple, right? It's not like snapping a finger and everything just goes over there. So that's really what interoperability was about to me and why we were so interested in it and MRED was so interested in it. So we were really happy to be able to support that when Riso started talking about it as well uh, because it is definitely a pain point within agents and brokerages right now. And there's a lot of different use cases that get talked about when it comes to interoperability. And we've got a nice backlog there, but um, what we wanted to talk about today is focusing in a little bit more on that. So let's talk about our agenda a little bit and what we're gonna work on today. First up is we had done some research on other industries and we have some specific examples of interoperability within um, a couple different areas that I thought were useful for how they approached looking at interoperability within their industry and how they approached uh, putting that together, putting together standards, putting together programs, doing implementation that I think gives us a nice roadmap to take a look at when we're doing it ourselves. And then after that, we're gonna talk about our specific use case that we dialed in as a work group uh, that we're gonna share here today and get your feedback on uh, before we start going into testing and prototyping with that. We'll have some opportunity, obviously, for you to talk a little bit about interoperability within your organization and how you're handling it and some of the challenges you have there. So we're definitely still gathering use cases for our backlog. And then finally, we're gonna talk a little bit uh, in the second half of the presentation. I'll be up here for the first half, and in the second half, we're gonna bring up uh, Josh and Paul, and we're gonna talk a little bit about common schema and how that potentially supports interoperability amongst, uh, as well as a bunch of other things within Reso. So that's kind of the feel for the day over the next hour, what we're planning on doing. Uh, we'll have two presentations and then a quick panel uh, with a couple speakers up here to talk about their opinions. And then obviously you can do your Q&A and your opinions on all of this as well. All right. So let's talk about the other teams first. So first one was healthcare. Healthcare, how many people here have ever had to switch a doctor? Yeah. How much fun was that, right? Like when you talk about interoperability, you talk about your medical records, being able to switch that from one provider to another. We're seeing that get better and better. Uh, there are different programs and apps now that work to make that a little bit easier, but that was obviously a huge problem for interoperability to look at. And they had some areas specifically that they were focusing on. Uh, they wanted to keep up with changing federal regulations, highly, highly regulated industry, right? And the things that change all the time that they have to really conform to. They had to get the right data sets you know, real estate, we talk about all the big data we have, but think about the big data available in the healthcare industry and how you can leverage tools like artificial intelligence on those data sets, but only if all those data sets can be combined and used together. They talked a little bit about 
having securely transferring and exchanging that data. So about security and privacy. Obviously, that's really, really important uh, in that experience for healthcare. And then giving patients more access to their own data. So because you're the patient, it is your information, you should be able to control that and own that experience. So how many have heard of Blue Button 2.0? Anyone heard of that yet? Okay, so nobody's on Medicare in this room. Such a young group, great. So Blue, <laughs> Blue Button 2.0 was an implementation of healthcare interoperability. And it is a really, really simple implementation, but it works really well for those people who use it, which is essentially if you're on Medicare, you hit that blue button when you're going into mymedicare.gov and it downloads a file with all of your information and that file is already in a format that will work with anyone else that's attached to that blue button API. So any provider you go to, any specialty you go to within this My Medicare network that uses that blue button API, your data can easily pass from one system to another. There's no changing of any kind of file format or information. You as the customer, as the patient, can really easily move that from one section to another. So for them, their key benefits that they were really trying to do with interoperability, and I think a lot of these should sound very familiar for us on the real estate side, is they wanted to improve that overall experience. So they wanted to make that patient feel like they had the experience that they wanted out of um, their doctor's care. They wanted greater patient safety. They wanted to make sure that the uh, patient had stronger privacy and stronger security by being able to understand what data was out there available on them, who had that data, and actually within that blue button API, you have the ability to restrict access to that data as well. So if you're not working with a provider anymore or you wanna change something that that provider has, you have that ability through that API. Higher productivity and reduced costs. It's not custom integrations every single time. It's one set of data. So all the providers can focus more on features of their product, not ingesting that data, which for all the technology vendors in the room should sound like a really, really welcome idea. And then finally, more accurate public health data in general. So this is more about like state of the industry as a whole. The idea that if you have standardized data, you can collect that data into data sets and then we can make better public health decisions based off of that aggregate data. So it ends up helping everyone by having this all together. The other really big industry that's focusing on interoperability is finance. Um, finance has different areas of focus, but again, still some similarity with us. Uh, they're wanting to continue to promote competition within that. They're trying to increase their service offers, offerings by creating economies of scale so that they can get better innovation out of their product. And one of the areas that they were really looking at was mobile money. How many people have ever done Venmo or Chase Quick Pay or anything similar to that? Anyone in the room done any of those? Okay, great. So this should be a really easy concept for most of us in that um, in the uh, country of Tanzania, actually a few years back, they were trying to set up the ability to do mobile money transfers. And there was a bunch of different banks, a bunch of different networks. There was a lot of fees involved for someone to send money to another person. And how they attached, or how they attacked that was going after interoperability. Let's create standards. So the Bank of Tanzania stepped in and said, let's work together to come up with standards so we can share that data back and forth. And then you can compete based on features of your app, not on the basic data that you're sending back and forth. Again, something that should sound pretty familiar to us. And they put together a white paper, they implemented these standards, and now they're able to do better mobile money transfers through products like Venmo, Chase Quick Pay that we are familiar with over here, but other banks in Tanzania, they're able to do that in that country. So lessons they learned there was that you need to allow the industry to define the rules. Um, so, they brought in the participants, the people who had those different mobile money networks, and asked them to help put together those standards, much like RISO is bringing in everyone involved in the industry here to help put together the rules, because you don't want to enforce something on someone who's had no say in it. They needed an industry champion. There was one specific network in Tanzania that said, you know, we could compete all day, all night on this, but ultimately it's going to be better for all of our customers if we work together and put together these standards. So you needed that champion to kind of push that forward. They had the neutral broker, which was the Bank of Tanzania, to kind of play referee in the middle because it was still all competitors working together, just like RISO does for us. They wanted to make sure everyone was speaking the same language, standards, having that data dictionary. And they had to have a plan. And most importantly, and this is what I really try and remember whenever we're thinking interoperability, because interoperability is such a huge concept, is don't expect to accomplish it all at once. That you have to be realistic about what we're trying to do and the steps we're trying to take. So, That'll make more sense as we get into what our first use case really is. 
So this was a favorite word that came out of that Tanzania report, coopetition. So the idea that competitors cooperate on certain aspects of the business but compete aggressively on others. I mean, what better way to describe real estate than that term, right? Because that's what agents do every single day. They cooperate and they compete. Uh, they cooperate on the things that'll make all of their lives easier and then they compete on the rest to find those points of differentiation. So those are big problems in healthcare and finance being tackled. Um, there's a lot of really big problems in real estate that we could tackle when it comes to interoperability, but we wanted to start a bit smaller and bite off something that we could actually chew, build some momentum. So what did Riso already have available that we could use that would help support interoperability? And according to that very scientific study that we just had on that screen, listing update is something that was of interest to many, came out last year, talked about a lot at Riso conferences, um, but we're not seeing a lot of actual usage of that. So what's a real life use case that could be done with listing update that also supports the interoperability concept? And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. So what I have up here is a nice little diagram of a typical generic life of a listing. So I'm gonna walk through this really quick and then we'll talk about what we're doing with this here. So this is the start of it. The agent makes that first contact with the potential seller. And this is just on the listing side, right? So the agent makes that first contact with the seller. They get that referral, they do some kind of marketing, but they make that appointment. They make their presentation over here. That's in the living room, that's at their office. They're talking about all of their value proposition, what they can do. They get the contract signed, that's the kitchen table, right? The agreement being passed back and forth, signing on the dotted line. Then you do all of your staging and your prep work, getting that listing ready to sell. You take your photos and you upload it into the MLS. Once it's uploaded in the MLS, then you push that data to all the different websites out there. You start doing your marketing as an agent, telling everyone else about it. So doing your postcards, your digital marketing, whatever you might be doing there. You have your showings, people coming in and taking a look at it. Your seller's getting out of the house so people can come and take a look at it. You get an offer. That process starts. You go back and forth uh, with your negotiations and then hopefully, finally, you get a completed deal. Then you do your move out and then at the end you celebrate because the whole thing's done, right? Now, that's a very simplistic pro version of this and there's a lot more that goes into it, but what's interesting about this is when we did our case studies kind of planning interoperability, there's anywhere from 20 to 30 different systems that an agent's gonna interact with in just this process. That they're doing different logins to, that they're adding information into, that they're going into on a regular, if not daily basis. So that's a lot of opportunities for duplication, for inaccurate information, and really for lost time and revenue for an agent, spending time on data entry and not spending time on representing their clients. So in looking at that listing, our ultimate interoperability, interoperability goal is to have an end-to-end -end system where everything just flows through. And maybe that's one system, maybe that's multiple systems, but the idea is as an agent, I start a transaction, I start a client, and it goes everywhere else I need it to go. But we want to dial into one really specific part at the beginning of that process. No Super Trooper fans in the audience? Really? Oh, you guys are lame. All right. Um, <laughs> so we want to take a closer look at the very beginning part of that process, getting the listing, and how that listing gets from getting it signed to actually putting it into the MLS so it gets distributed everywhere else. So here's some of the steps that go into that. Okay. So we've got the agent meets with the homeowners to pitch and win the listing. They get the listing agreement signed via a TMS. So this is all, we're gonna do this all through the digital side. So it's in a transaction, manage, transaction management platform of some kind, whether that's DocuSign or DotLoop or SkySlope or ZipForms or Transaction Desk, you know, pick your poison, but you have some kind of TMS. So we're not talking paper transaction at this point. So what data goes into that listing agreement? And we looked at a lot of different listing agreements in the work group. Um, across the states and across some brokerages. And we were trying to see what's the common data shared across it. And obviously every listing agreement is a little bit different, but some of the things that we saw popping up over and over again were things like the address, the city, the state, the zip, the county, PIN number. You had price, taxes, broker agent names, seller identifying information. You saw that showing up in most listing agreements. There were also things like features and exclusions, but by and large, this was stuff you saw over and over again. So you as the agent input all of that into your TMS um, and maybe your TMS is actually connected to your MLS, so some of that information feeds in, like maybe the address and the city and the state and zip. But then what you do is you get that signed, 
and then you pass that off to your office if you have a transaction coordinator, or you go in yourself to the MLS and you start a listing. And when you're starting a listing, some of that basic information that you're putting in is the address, the city, the state, the zip, the county, the PIN number, the price, the taxes, the brokerage and agent information, and the seller information. And that's where we first saw our first duplicate data, right? And doing interviews and focus groups and surveys, this is very similar information that's being entered in both places. And as an agent, if I'm entering that twice, again, that just gives me that much more opportunity to have a mistake, to have something get missed. So, and looking at that, what was the other thing we saw in common between those fields? We saw that completing the listing forms in a TMS and entering that enlisting information in the MLS had a lot of RISO data dictionary fields in common there. And if we have those standardized fields in both systems, why are we making people re-enter those twice? And that's where something like listing update came in. Because listing update obviously uses a lot of those same fields. It's something that's already available through RISO. And like, this is a prototype that we should try and build out and implement, okay? So that was the concept that we worked on as a work group, trying to dial down TMS to something that was more manageable from the very start. Uh, and it is TMS into MLS, because originally we had pitched making one transaction management platform working with another transaction management platform. That's something we definitely still want to handle, but you got to give something to get something, right? And this is something that we can give to transaction management platforms by giving them a little bit more stickiness to their platform and allowing someone to potentially start a listing out of a TMLS, TMS platform and push it to the MLS. And that's really where our digital listing remix comes in. So we get the listing agreement signed via that transaction management platform. And then we create a draft listing or a partial listing or an incomplete listing, whatever you call that terminology in the MLS from the transaction management platform system. So as an example, I get something signed in .loop, and I hit a button, and it starts my listing in my MLS system. So in, for us, Connect MLS, I'd be able to start that. And it would bring in those fields that we had just shown a couple slides back to get that started there. And we talked a lot about, do we try and do a whole listing? What kind of listing do we do in there? Do we mess with status? Do we mess with maintenance? Um, and what really came up was, uh, this was a big question that we talked a little bit uh, during the work group, but then even during this conference, we've talked about more with people who are trying this. And you start with the draft because it's a limited set of fields. It's not active. There's less rules to go after, right? So the business rules are really, really tough when it comes to making listing update work because everyone has different rules at an MLS level, and there's a lot of conditions tied to those rules. This conversation just had this morning, actually. Um, and that was something that we have to really think about a lot before we go beyond the draft. Because for most draft, partial, incomplete listings, you're talking you know, 5, 10, 15 fields. It's really not a lot just to get something started. It's not active, but at least it's getting it going for that agent. So it was one question that we had for ourselves. The other question then was, um, how does this change our listing workflow? Including with something like computer vision coming in. So if we're starting something from a transaction management platform and not from an MLS anymore, how does something like computer vision, which needs those photos to fill in fields, how does that play into this? So we have to think about some of the consequences of starting listings outside of the MLS. And this, these are not new questions, right? Anyone who's done anything with Upstream knows that these are a lot of the questions that they've had to deal with in putting this through. Um, and it's, I think, a lot of the issues they've been trying to work through. But the other thing we started asking, and this would be something I, you know, if you have suggestions here in this group, I definitely want to hear from you, is, is there anywhere else a listing could start? Because what we're trying to think about with this whole process is what is the listing workflow for an agent? Where do they really start doing something when it comes to getting that listing together? And how do we make it so we're matching their workflow and supporting their workflow rather than conforming their workflow to our technology, to our processes? So it's about letting them do the business the way they want to and not forcing them to do it a certain way because of the technology. So any other ideas? I'll just stop on that one right there. So any, yeah, Matt. Clearly, it often starts in the, in the CMA mm -hmm. when it's apparent to meet with a potential. Company. Right, yep, so you pull up a cloud CMA as an example or Moxie and put that together and you've got the CMA and maybe that's a way to start that draft listing right off the bat, especially if you feel really good about going into that listing presentation ahead of time, for sure. So anything else, CMAs, TMS, any other initials we want to throw out there? Great. The other question we had then is, okay, great. If we can get this working, where else could a TMS distribute data to? 
This was a specific, specific question that came actually from a survey that MRED did to our customers, where we were asking them, you know, what are the programs that are causing you problems, and where would you want things to talk to each other more? And one of the biggest ones outside of just transaction management platforms talking to each other was, I'd love it if my transaction management platform would feed into my CRM and into the MLS. So I have like a little triangle essentially, right? Like I'd want that information. If I've got contact information in the transaction management system because I'm starting a listing agreement or I'm starting a contract or a buyer's agency agreement, I'd want that to flow into the MLS where I'm setting up safe searches or into my CRM where I'm gonna keep track of that person after that transaction's done. I don't wanna to have to re-upload that over and over again. Um, so could that step be eliminated and could it just go from that TMS to both those places right away and start that? So that's not something we're doing in this first use case, but it's something to think about when we're trying to decide where all this information could get pushed from no matter where it gets started. So where else could a TMS distribute data to? Any ideas there? No ideas, all right. So this is what we're starting with. Uh, we do actually have, um, oh, sorry, yes, right there. Absolutely, yes. Could be either one. So actually one of the, I guess, concepts we talked about a lot is there's a lot of talk in the brokerage world of building your own platform, right? We have a couple different large brokerages who they're trying to build their own technology stack. They want to own all that data. And at some point they're going to want to write that listing to their MLS. They want it to start there and have all the information there from the beginning. Uh, we have a couple in our market that while they haven't asked for it yet, I mean, it's within months that they're gonna probably come to us and say, hey, let's do this. And that was another reason why we went down the listing update route because that's gonna be a real life issue for brokerages soon that they're gonna wanna have that control and push that in there. And we still want to be involved in that because we still need our rules standardizing and cleaning that data, making sure that it's accurate for where it gets distributed out. So we're still part of that process. But yes, brokerages, absolutely, whether they have in-house back office, in-house TMS, in-house CRM, in-house CMA, like there's a lot of things they're all trying to do on their own platforms these days. Mm -hmm. Accounting and commission systems. Oh, absolutely, yep. So our work group, everyone in our work group at least, and hopefully everyone in this room here, was down with updatability. And the reason why is really you know, as an MLS or a technology partner or a vendor or anyone else, who really likes doing the same thing over and over again if it's completely redundant, right? So how do we, that's really what we're doing in the work group right now, is we're looking at all these individual steps and we're saying how can we eliminate these duplications of data? How can we eliminate these redundancies so that make that just flow through? And we really need to talk about this and how we make it happen by making that flow of data easier. Um, and what we're really talking about there then, it goes a little bit beyond standards. Um, and that's what's gonna lead us into the next part of our presentation because we need to talk more about how you make that data into a better shape. How does it become more common between all the different people consuming that data? So we can more easily pass from one vendor to another. How do we really promote that concept of coopetition, right, that we talked about earlier? And to do that, I mean, Data dictionary is a great core, but there's more that we can do when it comes to making that data more consistent for anyone coming in and using that. So we want to talk about forming the Voltron of real estate. And with that, I'm going to bring up Josh and Paul, and they're going to talk a little bit about common schema. And so they're going to get into the more technical side of how we could potentially make some of these interoperability use cases work out. So Josh and Paul, if you want to come up.